Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm very excited to bring my conversation that I had with Steve Brasati. Steve is a paleontologist and he's on the faculty of the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He's a BS in Geophysical Sciences from the University of Chicago. He's a master's in paleobiology from the University of Bristol and a PhD in Earth and Environmental Sciences from Columbia University. He is the author of over 150 peer-reviewed scientific papers. His work has been everywhere, um, such as the National Geographic, Scientific America. He is the author of the book, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, which was a New York Times bestseller. It is the de facto popular science book on dinosaurs. If you want to read um, a good go-to book on dinosaurs that does a good mix of you know, relevant science um, and how we understand, you know, dinosaurs in an easy, accessible way. That is the book. And he is also the author of the new book, The Rise and Reign of the Mammals. And he is a big time contributor to many projects, including BBC's Walking with Dinosaurs and the new Jurassic World film Dominion, where he was the, the lead uh, paleontologist uh, consultant there. In this conversation, we talk about both books. Um, we talk about the first book. So the first half of the conversation is about the rise and fall of the dinosaurs. And the second half of the conversation is about the rise and reign of the mammals. We start by talking about how his two books are connected and how they have overlap. We talk about when was the first dinosaur um, on the scene? Where does the first there's not really a first, but how do we know when we start seeing animals that we could say these are dinosaurs, they're their own kind of species. We talked about how dinosaurs survived the Great Dying in the Permian period and diversified in the Triassic period. We talked about the taxonomy of dinosaurs and what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur. Um, I believe Steve said that his favorite uh, dinosaur is a T-Rex. And so we talk about the T-Rex and many of its features and what makes it stand out. We talk about how birds are dinosaurs, uh, modern day birds are dinosaurs. We then switch and we talk about the second book and we talk about what makes a mammal a mammal. Um, one of the things that he does, I mean, just brilliantly in the book is talking about the understanding of the jaw to understand how mammals are distinct. We talk about how mammals started small and became larger after the asteroid hit uh, during the Jurassic. We talk about how mammals continue to evolve after the Jurassic period period uh, to current day. And we talk about how humans fall in the line of mammals and the future of mammals on the planet. Um, I, I think I say it in the conversation, but you know, <laughs> the rise the the rise and fall of dinosaurs was such a fantastic book. Uh, I had reread it again before this conversation. And I thought to myself, I said, I don't know how, how he'll top this one. And um, The Rise and Reign of the Mammals is probably like the best sequel you can imagine. Um, it is it is just as good, if not better, than The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. It is a fantastic book, um, very accessible. You know, it, dare I say it was a page turn. I mean, I, I probably read it in two days. I mean, it was, it was a very, very good book. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. Steve is absolutely wonderful. He has this infectious enthusiasm for for science and for trying to understand uh, animals past and present. Um, he's an absolutely wonderful communicator in written word and also in spoken word. And so I just I had I had such a fun time uh, talking with him about so many things and and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that all listeners will, will enjoy this conversation. So now I bring you Steve Brasati. I'm here with Steve Brasati. Steve, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, really looking forward to talking to you. Yeah, it's a real pleasure and a long time coming. And we've been meeting for a while to talk uh, yeah. dinosaurs and mammals. And so I'm happy uh, we could have the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, we have uh, been uh, corresponding for a little bit. And so you have 
two fabulous books. Uh, the most recent is The Rise and Reign of the uh, the Mammals, which uh, I had just finished maybe about a week or so ago. And I have to say, um, sometimes the sequels are a little bit better than the originals. Like I got to say, the I new think, book is really good. I mean, the I first book was great, that. but the new book is really good. I, I was like, that. I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I think you're one of the first people to really properly read it because, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a new book and everything in the world of publishing, like in the every part of the world today is, is delayed, you know? So yeah. it's not like we've gotten the advanced proofs and all this out to, to, to people. Yeah. I mean, this is a new book and it's really new. So I'm, I'm glad for that feedback. And I think, uh, you know, what I'm excited about with, with the rise and reign of the mammals is, you know, it is a follow up in, in a sense to the rise and fall of the dinosaurs that I wrote uh, about four years ago. Uh, but it, it's different because I mean, this is our story. I mean, dinosaurs mm -hmm. are awesome. We all love dinosaurs. That's what I came into paleontology studying. That's what I've spent most of my career studying. That's what every five-year-old wants to do. They want to study <laughs> dinosaurs. They don't, I want right. to you know, study mammals. I've never mm -hmm. met a five-year-old that says that, but <laughs> the mammals are us. This mm -hmm. is our heritage, our history. This is our family. And really, when it comes down to it, I think mammals are as fascinating as dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe it, just think, what's the biggest animal that's ever lived? It's not mm -hmm. a brontosaurus. It's not right. a brachiosaurus. It's, it's a blue it's whale. A blue it's whale. a mammal. Yeah. It's living yeah. right now with mm -hmm. us. That is, I think, a mind-blowing fact. It is very mind-blowing. goes to show mammals, mammals, mammals have it all. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, I want to ask real quick about the book, but before we do, just just tell people kind of your uh, potted uh, introduction, kind of who you are, what you do, what you study, and all the things you're uh, associated with and doing. So I'm Steve Brusadia, and I'm a paleontologist. I'm one of those lucky people that does get to dig up dinosaur bones and mammal bones for my job. That's cool. Uh, and so I'm, I'm from... Uh, the Midwest in America. I grew up around Chicago, but for the last, nearly the last decade, I've been in Scotland and, and I'm a mm. professor at the University of Edinburgh. And so mm. very much now Scotland is my home. And uh, I teach here at the university. I run a research lab. We do field work uh, around the world, digging up new fossils. I get to advise some of the most amazing uh, young students and postdocs in the field. I mean, the, the, the number of people of just really good people that are so far beyond my level when I was at their stage right now is incredible. And that goes to show how quickly this field of paleontology has grown and diversified. Uh, so, you know, a lot of my job is mentoring the new generation. Uh, and then I, I try to do a lot of uh, outreach, a lot of engagement, dinosaurs and, and mammals and other fossils. I mean, let's face it. They're cool. People mm -hmm. are interested in yeah. them. You know? Super so, cool. <laughs> so it'd be a shame to be a paleontologist and not work with the public. And, mm -hmm. and then, so I write books. I give lectures. I, I do broadcasting work. I consult um, on, on television and film projects. So the, the books, which we mentioned, The Rise and Reign of the Mammals is the new one that's just come out June 2022. Mm -hmm. And that's a bit of a follow up to The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, which came out in 2018. And those are pop science books. They're meant for everybody. Mm -hmm. I really wrote those books with my high school self in mind. That's when I became interested and obsessed with, with dinosaurs and with fossils. So it's that kind of audience I'm going for, really anybody from high school on up. But but with that being said, there's a lot of younger kids that have read the dinosaur book and sent me emails. Uh, so anyway, I love to do that kind of writing, especially really writing for the public, for the largest number of people as possible. Mm -hmm. Scientific writing is so boring and mm -hmm. so dull. I, I hate spending my time and my words on that. Uh, and, and broadcasting again in films and stuff and so i've been working a lot recently on the jurassic world film the new one jurassic world dominion i'm yeah. the paleontology consultant on that film which has been a huge amount of fun yeah I bet. Just working with some of the most creative people in hollywood a real privilege to to yeah. represent science in mm -hmm. this film. Mm -hmm. yeah my understanding was that that was always somewhere in the plans with uh with uh, michael Crichton and spielberg was to when do we ever tell the story where the dinosaurs are kind of out in the world i think that was always that was when do we have the fully functioning park which they kind of did in the last two movies are sort of functioning and then when are they like out in the world with others so i think uh it will be really cool to uh to, to yeah, see all the aspects absolutely. of the movie if you've ever thought you know what would it be like if dinosaurs and humans really coexisted if we really had mm -hmm. to share the same space if we really had to us as people every time we go out 
uh, and walk to work or, mm-hmm. you know, cycle to the gym or whatever, that we have to worry, is there a T-Rex lurking, you know, behind <laughs> those trees? That's what this, this film yeah. will do. So in a way, yeah. you know, with the, in our topic here in this chat, dinosaurs and mammals, mm-hmm. the film <laughs> brings that yeah. together. Yeah, yeah. So I guess uh, for just real quick on the new book, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, the, so the first book is The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, which we'll talk about a little bit. But I guess just why did you want to, I mean, you talk about it a little bit in the new book, but why did you want to write The Rise and Reign of, of the Mammals? Um, and how would you, how would you see they're uh, loosely connected, I guess? And then we can talk about that kind of I think it's becoming more and more corrected now that most people thought that mammals were after the dinosaurs, but now we understand that they were uh, before or at the same time as the dinosaurs and and how they were able to survive. So just tell us why you decided to write the second book um, uh, after writing the first one. Well, I guess the the, the the most honest answer to that is, hey, the first book, people <laughs> seem to like it. They, you know, it sold some copies. And of course, you always want to do a sequel, right? So, right, right. But, you know, but but really, it's, it's what you say. That's the main thing. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions about mammals that people have. Mammals have never really had the same limelight, at least in terms of fossil mm-hmm. mammals, as the dinosaurs have had. Yet there is an incredible story. There are amazing fossil mammals. I mean, there used to be things like woolly mammoths, you know, big mm-hmm. hairy elephants. Okay, I think... Most people know those. You've heard of those. You've seen the Ice Age films. You mm-hmm, maybe see them mm-hmm. in a museum. But there used to be giant sloths that could dunk a mm-hmm. basketball. There used to be armadillos the size of Volkswagens. There used to be whales that had arms and legs and walked on yeah. land. The first elephants were the size of miniature poodles. Mm-hmm. And there used to be dozens of other species of fossil humans. These are things that don't reach the pop culture so much. And so I really felt there was a lot of misconceptions about mammals and this whole incredible story of evolution hadn't really been told in the format of a pop science book. And it's our story, it's us, Mm -hmm. this is our evolution, this is our family. If we wanna understand ourselves, why we look the way they, that, that we do, why we grow the way that we do, why mm-hmm. we think the way that we do, why we sense the world the way that we do. We, we have to turn to evolution. We have to turn to the fossil record. We can see how we've evolved our intelligence and, and mm-hmm. so on. So this is very much our story, but it's not only our story. We are only one of many, many thousands of sublime species of mammals, our closest cousins, many of which sadly are quite endangered. They're in a precarious state. So I want people to appreciate mammals and learn about these incredible mammals that are still with us before it's too late. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned her in the book and she had a book come out, um, uh, Beasts Among Us. Is that the right right title? um... Yeah, Yeah, that's right. Uh, what's her name? I'm drawing a blank. Elsa. Elsa. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she, uh, she wrote also a, a similar story, but it's interesting how there was so much of your writing that was like stuff I obviously had never read or, 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 or knew about. And, and hers also tells the story, the mammal story, but it's also different in its own way. So it's so cool how there's like this really cool overlap that, that is happening where people are starting to think more about mammals. Yeah, and, and I'm excited about that. And Elsa was my PhD student in, in Edinburgh. So, you know, that's very, great. Very proud that's... of, um, you know, how her career is taking off. And, and, you know, she's an example of uh, the, the younger generation. There's just mm-hmm. a lot of people now that are studying not mm-hmm. only dinosaurs, but all kinds of fossils. And we're learning mm-hmm. a lot about mammal evolution because mm. of this new generation of students. So I try to give a lot of them a platform in in, mm. in the new book on mammals, um, tell stories of mm-hmm. some really cool discoveries made by students, some major studies that have been done by students. You know, my of course, many of my own students, <laughs> I'm going to boost them. Yeah, from, of course. Other students yeah. From, from elsewhere. And, that, yeah. and that's why, you know, the, the field of paleontology, it's like so many fields these days, mm. it's rapidly diversifying, rapidly expanding. So many more people are getting an opportunity to pursue it. And when you have more people from more places around the world, from more backgrounds, different ways of thinking, that's when we really, really mm-hmm. make these big breakthroughs. No, no, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, we'll have to make it a trilogy somehow. So maybe you'll write a book on <laughs> on birds or something like that. That sounds like a nice maybe, progression yeah, there too. Birds, birds is a nice offshoot there. Yeah. <laughs> Get back to the dinosaur world a little <laughs> right. bit. You know, right. we'll see. But, I'm not, I'm not in a rush to write anything new now. <laughs> I'm writing this thing during lockdown, I mostly wrote this in 2020. Uh-huh. Uh, there was that was tough because we had a sure. uh, a newborn at that point, oh, and boy. you know everything, all the 
teaching at the university was suddenly made, you know, online and we were, you know, had to organize, basically cancel field work and lab yeah. work and find ways to, to keep student projects going. And it, it was a challenging time. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I don't want to do it again. However, you know, I dedicate the, the new book to my favorite little mammal, who's Anthony, my son, who's now oh, two and a half. But, nice. you know, I learned yeah. just writing the book while I had a young kid Mm-hmm. was it incredible in the sense that I learned so much about what it is to be a mammal just by watching <laughs> him grow and develop and start to explore the world and, and, and start to walk and start to talk mm-hmm. and so on. So in that way, I think I've been very privileged to have written this book at this time. No, that's, that's, that's really, really nice. Yeah. I, I mean, they, you know, kids teach us so much about the world and about ourselves. And so it just, you know, it's, it can be such a wonderful experience. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about the first book, and then yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of I found a lot of bridging of sorts in, in a lot of ways, which was which was super interesting. So we'll we'll get to that section, but real quick, I guess the one thing I want to ask is where can I mean this is sort of hard, right? Because it's all in an evolutionary timeline. But where do we find, or where do most folks like you know people? What do you guys fight about? Paleontologists fight about the first dinosaur, and in what period? Uh, uh, what Earth period is it that, that we find that in CS? So where's the kind of starting point, point when you're talking about the rise of dinosaurs? Paleontologists are always trying to find the first of something or the <laughs> oldest of something. Right. You know, right. Even if it's, you know, just a few years older, like we all, you know, it's one of those milestones, right? Because mm-hmm. we always want to understand the origin of things. This is natural, I think, in all walks of life. We, we're, yeah. we're always interested in origin stories. And with dinosaurs, uh, the first dinosaurs actually lived around the time of the first mammals. And this was back in the Triassic period. Mm-hmm. And this was, uh, for the first dinosaurs are roughly 230 million years old. These are true dinosaurs, things that meet the classic definition. They did have ancestors that lived a little bit before that. Mm-hmm. But the first properly true dinosaurs turn up as fossils in rocks that are about 230 million years old. This is kind of in the middle part of the Triassic period. This was a time when there was one single giant supercontinent. All the land was gathered together as Pangaea. It was hot, it was dry, no ice at the poles, but big storms, mega monsoons, they call these storms, ravaged this ancient supercontinent. It was a very harsh place to live. And life was recovering from a horrible extinction. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the preceding period, the Permian period, Mm -hmm. was the biggest mass extinction in Earth history. Maybe up to 95% of all species died. Mm. This is the the great dying, right? Yes. The great dying, the mother of all mass extinctions, Mm -hmm. whatever you Mm -hmm. want to call it. Mm -hmm. And it was the closest life has ever come to being completely snuffed out ever Mm -hmm. since life first evolved billions of years ago. Yet, there were survivors. Not a lot, but there were some. And from those survivors, there was this one peculiar plucky, pesky little group of reptiles that started to grow faster, move faster, put their limbs under their body. They became sprinters. Mm. And those little reptiles, just the size of house cats, they became the dinosaurs. So we see the first true dinosaurs about 230 million years ago. We see some meat eaters, some plant eaters at that time. These dinosaurs are starting to diversify early on. But the key thing is they're not very special. When the first dinosaurs entered the scene, they didn't look anything like T-Rex or Brontosaurus. They were not at the top of the food chain. Hmm. They were not apex animals. They were not dominant animals. They were bit characters. They they, they were B-list actors at best in a world where crocodiles and giant amphibians and many other types of animals were staking their claim and also diversifying. And the first dinosaurs really were the size of dogs, the size of humans. Some got to be the size of horses, but that's as big as they would get for tens of millions of years. Hmm. Yeah. So I guess two follow-ups on that is the first question is what, I mean, obviously there was a, a, a big kind of explosion of life again, right? After the Permian period, but what was it about Pangaea at the time in the early to mid Triassic that made the environment suitable or habitable for, for these uh, creatures? And then also why, I, I mean, why is hard? How, how is it that we know that dinosaurs became, they started to become so much bigger um, and they diversified? There's so many different types. Uh, just from the fossil record, we know. What do you think is up with that in terms of, is it something with the environment or what was the contributing to the, the diversification? I think the biggest thing was that when these first dinosaurs were originating and starting to diversify, 
they were kind of doing it in a vacuum, not entirely, but you had this big mass extinction that cleared off so many things. I mean, just imagine going out and the Grim Reaper, you know, striking down, uh, you know, 95 out of every 100 things. I mean, the world is going to be pretty empty in the aftermath mm -hmm. of that, which means those survivors have abundant opportunity. It's a new frontier for them. And it's no coincidence that this is the time in the Triassic period when you get not only the first dinosaurs, but the first mammals, the mm. first crocodiles, the first turtles, the first pterodactyls. So many of these major groups of animals, many of which are still here today, got their start at that time because there was opportunity more than anything. Mm. It wasn't really anything... I don't think about the physical world. It wasn't the temperature. It wasn't the fact there was a supercontinent. More than anything, it was they had the opportunity. The incumbents were mostly gone. Mm. But then, of course, dinosaurs diversified even further, and some of them became enormous. That would take some time, though. Mm -hmm. And really, for the first 30-ish million years of dinosaur history, dinosaurs were not very special. You know, they were one of many groups living on Pangaea. They were not at the top of the food chain. On land, the top of the food chain was mostly these grotesque, enormous crocodile cousins. Mm. In the water or in, and in the rivers and the lakes, it was these salamanders the size of cars. Mm -hmm. You know, they were the things that ruled that world. The dinosaurs were just off there, you know, a little bit, you know, off, off center stage. Uh, but then a lot of those other animals, they were hit by another mass extinction. At the end of the Triassic period, this is about 200 million years ago, that supercontinent of Pangaea began to break apart. Mm. And of course it did. I mean, this is why we have separate continents today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and today, mm -hmm. you know, North America and Europe and Africa and South America, they're separated by the Atlantic Ocean. That marks the wound. That was the fracture zone. Mm. But before water filled those gaps, first the earth bled lava. Mm. And for about 600,000 years, there were these mega volcanoes that were just spewing not just the lava but all this carbon dioxide and methane and these toxic gases into the atmosphere that led to a runaway global warming event that led to a mass extinction uh, and so a lot of these crocs and big salamanders and other things they died out the dinosaurs though were the great survivors of that extinction i know it's funny to think about that because we know mm -hmm. we know the end of the story mm -hmm. we know that later on there's this asteroid that's going to hit and the dinosaurs are going to be the victims mm -hmm. but at first they were the survivors now whether that was due to luck whether that was due to something special about them that helped them endure during the, that that you know short period of chaos it's hard to say it's one of the biggest mysteries about dinosaurs and I, I don't have a good answer. I wish I could tell you, but I'm pretty sure somebody in the new generation of paleontologists, a brilliant student, will figure this out. Why did the crocs and the big salamanders and these other incumbents that were doing so well before those volcanoes erupted, why did they succumb? Mm -hmm. Why did the dinosaurs sail right on through? Mm -hmm. We don't know, but what we do know is once dinosaurs got to the other side, once they got across that minefield of those volcanoes, then, hey, it was almost like a vacuum again. It was a wide open mm. frontier. That's when dinosaurs really started to diversify. Mm. That's when they started to get bigger. That's when you start to see dinosaurs supersizing into things that mm. were much, much bigger than, say, elephants. And then before too long, these things would get to be as large as Boeing 737 airplanes, <laughs> these long neck dinosaurs. And other ones. You know, they, they evolved their horns and spikes and frills and duck bills and dome heads and all these fantastic things that make dinosaurs so charismatic. Yeah, it's just super interesting. It's always this kind of death, rebirth, death, rebirth kind of thing in, in the periods of Earth's history and then how that impacts not only the environment but also various animals. Um, the, so the Jurassic period, right after the splitting, is is like their time. This is where they reign, right? This is the the big time of the. That's the right. I, yes, I'm talking about the Jurassic. I should have used the uh, the term. <laughs> of course, I've just I've, I've buried the lead here. We're in the Jurassic now, after <laughs> yeah. that Triassic mass extinction. Mm -hmm. and there's a reason it's Jurassic World, Jurassic right. Park, right. because right. <laughs> this is when dinosaurs become dinosaurs. The things we all know and love, the mm -hmm. big ones, the scary ones. Yeah, and so just a little bit. Uh, we'll we'll get to the T Rex because you talk about it in the first book and that's kind of like the big the big dinosaur but what is this i guess in terms of taxonomy you talk about three classes of dinosaurs so how do we usually understand just kind of how dinosaurs um in terms of or their groupings how we understand their groupings as of as of uh, right now so to get into the weeds and i won't go into it too much because it's the kind of thing that 
few people care about, including me, as somebody who actually studies this stuff. Like, <laughs> what, what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur? Okay, it all comes down to definitions. Yeah. Sure. Every group, whether it's mammals, dinosaurs, crocodiles, they're defined in a certain way. And dinosaurs are defined as a certain group on the family tree of, of life that shares certain features of their skeletons. These are things that only dinosaurs have that other things don't have. Mm. And these are, they, they're not dramatic things like, you know, mammals have hair. Yes, you know, that's easy. The dinosaur ones are, are some nuanced features of the bones, but they mostly have to do with dinosaurs having a more upright stance with putting their limbs underneath their bodies instead of sprawled out to the side like a crocodile or a lizard. Mm -hmm. So there's modifications to the pelvis and to the backbone that allow these dinosaurs to stand up. And that's what really defines what the dinosaur is. And we first start to see fossils that meet that criteria, mm -hmm. those criteria, um, that definition in the Triassic. From there on out, dinosaurs diversify into lots of different groups. Mm -hmm. But there's a few major subgroups. There's really three major subdivisions of the dinosaur family tree. And one of those is the theropods. These are the meat eaters. These are things like T-Rex and Velociraptor. Mm -hmm. Some of them did become plant eaters and fish eaters and bug eaters, but most of them were meat eaters. The second group is the, the sauropods. These are the giant long neck dinosaurs, Brontosaurus, Brachiosaurus, the biggest things that have ever lived on land. Plant guzzlers. These things would have eaten hundreds of pounds of leaves and stems every single day just to keep their bodies going. Mm -hmm. And then the third group, that's the Ornithischian dinosaurs. And this is a motley crew of things like the horned dinosaurs, like Triceratops, mm -hmm. the dinosaurs with plates on their backs, like Stegosaurus, the duck-billed mm -hmm. dinosaurs that had big beaks, just a whole variety of different things, mostly plant eaters in that group. So, so it's those three major groups, sauropods, theropods, Ornithischians, and then mm -hmm. they each, of course, spawned many, many, many sure. subgroups. We sure. know of thousands of species of dinosaurs. There's at least 1,500 species that have been found by scientists. We're finding more of them than ever before. There's something like 50 new species every year that is found wow. now. So it's like wow. once a week, somebody's yeah. finding a totally new type of dinosaur. Wow. But really, we're just scratching the surface. I mean, if you think about today, one moment in time, mm -hmm. there's like 14,000 species of birds just living right. today. These are right. dinosaurs. So right. if you take that and you, you extrapolate out, you multiply out by the hundred plus million years dinosaurs lived, there were surely hundreds of thousands, if not millions yeah. of species of dinosaurs, which means there's a lot more still to be found out there for any young fossil collector. Yeah. Well, I wonder how much of it is just uh, accessibility. You know, how are people able to now get to certain places they couldn't before in certain, you know, countries or, or certain places, you know, so that's always like, you know, super, super exciting to know, like how many, we, there's a certain amount we know now, but there's so many that are expanding. So just, just tell us really quick about the, the T-Rex. I'm not sure why, I mean, maybe you, maybe you know, I mean, but I mean, why is the T-Rex always like the like poster child for dinosaurs? Like, I don't, I, I mean, T-Rex is cool. I like the, the raptors myself, but, um, but why, why does T-Rex, is that because we have like the full skeletons that we can see and they're so like menacing? Like, what is it about the T-Rex? So just tell us, I guess in pop culture, why people like it, but just about the T-Rex, they're kind of their, you know, what we know about their physiology and behavior and, and what makes them so. Um, you know, important, I guess, for, for paleontologists. It is a very cliched thing, but, but I, I, I'll admit that T-Rex is my favorite dinosaur. <laughs> I know every kindergartner is going to tell you that, uh, but, but it's true for me. And I've been very privileged. I study T-Rex. It's one of That's the dinosaurs cool. I specialize in and other tyrannosaurs. And a lot of my scientific work has been uh, studying the anatomy of tyrannosaurs, understanding how they evolved such huge mm. size, how their skeletons changed, putting mm. together a family tree, that, that kind of stuff is kind of the bread and butter of, of my academic research. So I do love tyrannosaurs. Uh, and the reason I love them is because they truly were superlative animals. They are worthy of all the hype and all the hyperbole. There is nothing alive today that comes close to a T-Rex. T-Rex really was a, a dragon or a movie monster <laughs> made real. That's what it was. And in fact, I think it's more fantastic than the dragons of, of, of you know, lore and, and mm. sea serpents and unicorns and leprechauns and all these things humans have invented. I think T-Rex is more fantastic. It was real. This was an animal. It was literally the size of a London double-decker bus. Mm. This thing weighed seven or eight tons as an adult. I mean, that's bigger than an elephant, Yeah. but it ain't meat. Mm -hmm. And it had this huge head the size of a bathtub. 
when it opens its jaws, it it could it could engulf me, you know, mm-hmm. it could engulf mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. And it had about fifty teeth. Each one was the size and shape of a banana. It could bite so hard it crushed the bones of its prey. We know that it left behind crushed bones. We have oh ancient <laughs> oh, And wow. then yet it has the tiny little arms, arms yeah. <laughs> no bigger than our arms. That's so you know, wild. imagine that a London bus with human arms on the I mean, it's just a type <laughs> of animal that is both powerful and 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 just you know superlative, but also kind of funny, kind of weird, mm-hmm. kind of quirky. Mm-hmm. And by the way, it was also very smart. You know, we've done a lot yeah. of work recently, cat scanning tyrannosaur skulls and building digital models of the brain. Mm-hmm. These things had big brains for reptilian mm-hmm. type animals. They had great senses of smell, great senses of hearing, great eyesight. They had brawn and brains. Mm-hmm. And to me, that just adds to their iconic legacy. Mm. Yeah, it's it's interesting how, yeah, I mean, it's it, I, the thing that's fascinating about them is that they're massive and they're bipedal. Um, so they, they, there, there's some advantages to that, but I know some people have talked a little bit about their abilities for how they're able to regulate their temperature, how they're able to, a lot of their, their lung capacity, like a lot of their actual, what, what we know about their, um, physiology. So what, what is it about those pieces that make them distinct as well? The brain thing is, is one of them. I mean, the fact that these most infamous brutish predators from dinosaur history also were really smart. That really breaks convention, I think, mm-hmm. for what a lot of people think of dinosaurs, but that was key mm-hmm. to their repertoire. It wasn't that they were just big and they just had the, the, the enormous jaws and the thick teeth and their you know, hyper-powerful muscles. They were also very smart. So that, that's the big thing about T-Rex. T-Rex also grew very fast. You know, it, mm-hmm. when you think of an animal the size of a London bus, you think, Okay, you know, how does an animal reach that size? We're not talking about a bus that is built by humans. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about a building or a statue or something. We're talking about an animal that had to hatch from an egg mm-hmm. and grow into mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And the eggs of, of, of tyrannosaurs, we don't actually have any clear fossils of them. So that's one of these big things that somebody wants to find, a little T-Rex baby. I'm egg. sure, yeah. <laughs> but what we know from close relatives is that those T-Rex eggs were probably no bigger than, at the very biggest, something like a cantaloupe. So you would have had a tiny little baby in there hatching out, and it would have to grow into something the size of a bus. So you might think, oh, that that would take hundreds of years. Maybe it grew like a crocodile grows, like an iguana. It kind of grows mm-hmm. a little bit and comes to fill its cage. But no, we can tell how they grew because dinosaur bones have rings inside of them, just like a tree trunk. Mm. So we can count the rings, uh, and we can then you know make graphs showing you know, how, how, how they grew. We have, we have multiple fossils. We can see how big that fossil is, how many mm. rings it has, plot those things against each other. It gives you a growth curve. The amazing thing is nobody's ever found a T-Rex with more than 30 growth rings. So these things were born, they balked up, they reached maturity, they reproduced, they died all before they were 30. This is a James wow. Dean kind of lifestyle. You know, the living fast, <laughs> the dying young. And I mean, that's wow. crazy when you think about it. So that's not fast. only was T-Rex an amazing animal, but his whole biology was yeah, incredible. Wow. wow. Yeah, that's, 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 wow, I didn't know that. That's super fascinating. Wow. Well, I mean, I mean, I could keep talking about the T-Rex, but one, one more thing before we talk about, uh, move on to the mammals is, uh, I got to ask you about the whole birds. I mean, I got to ask you, I mean, it blew my mind when I first read this years ago and now I can't unsee it. Anytime I see birds outside my window, I just think of those, those are dinosaurs, right? And then when you start to see the way their head moves and the way they hop along, it's like, it's just dinosaurs, right? It's just, it's absolutely uh, spectacular. Um, just how do we, how do we know that? How do we know that bird, you know, dinosaurs, you know, um, or I guess you could say that birds are, uh, the, the, in the tree of, from dinosaurs, um, where do velociraptors fit in there if they do at all? And then you can maybe tell us about the kind of, um, colored feathers that some of the dinosaurs had as well. So you're absolutely right. Birds are dinosaurs. When I look out my window here and I see a pigeon or a gull, you know, I'm looking at a dinosaur, a true dinosaur. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, if the birds evolved from dinosaurs, they are part of the dinosaur family tree, part of the dinosaur family album. They are a dinosaur in the same way a T-Rex or a Brontosaurus is a dinosaur. Mm-hmm. They're just a strange type of dinosaur. So the way to think about it, and I know this is hard to wrap your heads around because we think dinosaurs are extinct, but no, they're not. And it's, but mm-hmm. to think about it, think about bats. You know, what's a bat? Well, a bat is a mammal. 
Mm-hmm. Obviously, a bat's a mammal. It has hair. It feeds its babies milk. It does all the things that mammals do. It's just a peculiar type of mammal that got small, evolved wings, developed the ability to fly. Mm-hmm. And birds are the dinosaur equivalent. They're a strange type of dinosaur that got small, evolved wings, developed the ability to fly. And we can tell that because birds have those distinctive features of dinosaurs, the things that define dinosaurs, those modifications to the the pelvis and the hind limb, for instance. Mm. They have the same dinosaur features that T. rex does, let's say. Not only that, but a lot of the things that make birds unique amongst modern animals, things like feathers, wishbones, wings, these are not unique to birds. They are found in other dinosaurs. The fossils Mm. of dinosaurs tell us that many dinosaurs had feathers. Many dinosaurs had wings, and they had wishbones and so on. So the the things that make birds birds today that we're so familiar with, they actually evolved piece by piece in their dinosaur ancestors. And, and, you know, we can even do remarkable things like tell the colors of some of these dinosaur feathers. If they're really well preserved, we can put them under a high-powered microscope, and we can see these little bubbles inside. And these are these little packages. They're called melanosomes, and they held pigment. And we can, and we know from modern day animals that different sizes and shapes of those melanosomes, they correspond to different colors. Mm. And so we can tell that some dinosaurs were brown, black, white, gray. Some of them had ginger colored feathers. Some of them had iridescent feathers that would have shined in the sun like a crow. Others had camouflage patterns and rings on their tails and so on, just like a lot of birds today. So it's an amazing thing, but and we just have to wrap our head around it. And I think the only way to maybe think about this is just imagine a world where every mammal has gone extinct. There's some catastrophe. Every type of mammal is killed off except for bats. Mm. And that's what we have today. Mm. You know, mm. The only dinosaurs left are birds. All the other ones were killed off by that asteroid. Mm. But dinosaurs still do remain just in one very particular and peculiar form. Mm, yeah, I remember when I talked to Richard Prom, who's a very famous ornithologist, and he was, you know, really important for the phylogeny of birds. And then he also was there. I think uh, he was part of the folks that figured out that birds had feathers and, and the colors and all that stuff. He was telling me a little about it, and it just blows my mind. It blow. It absolutely blows because we don't see that most of the time. We don't understand that, and so it's super crazy. So we, I, I will. Um, we've mentioned the extinction. I talked to Riley Black um, a couple months ago, and she was, uh, uh, was great. Uh, she wrote a great book, "The Last Days of the That's Dinosaurs." Yep. Yeah, it's yeah. really, really good. Um, and we had a we had a great conversation. And so we talk all about when uh, the extinction happened, and more, what was more interesting was what happened in the days afterwards, right? In the years afterwards, in the hundreds of years afterwards. So it was, it was a, a great, uh, great book. Um, so I guess on this period, though. So we can we can go into the the next book, which is the the mammals. And so, when do we know that mammals originated? To to again, same kind of question, right? What makes a mammal a mammal, right? <laughs> you know, we can talk about the first and the periods, but what makes a mammal a mammal? Obviously, there are some unique features there. So maybe just tell us about about that in terms of place and time and and the what it is that's defined. As you alluded to earlier, I think there is this perception that. The history of life proceeds in these nice, neat little packages. You know, one era gives rise to another. And in some ways it kind of does, but really the same with human history. You know, this is the way we package stuff looking back. Mm -hmm. Uh, When it comes to mammals, there there is this perception that the dinosaurs had their time, then they died, and then the mammals came on the scene, Mm -hmm. and the mammals took over from the dinosaurs. Now, that's true in a sense. When that asteroid hit 66 million years ago, this six-mile-wide asteroid, it did kill off all the non-bird dinosaurs. It did spare some mammals, and those mammals then went on to take over the world, to get bigger, to, to make many new species, to diversify, to form new ecosystems. That is true. However, the mammals had to survive in order to do that. They had to endure the extinction, which means they were already there. And in mm. fact, they had been there for a while. The very first mammals, as we touched on earlier, evolved, originated around the same time as the very first dinosaurs, way back in the Triassic period on the supercontinent of Pangaea. And these two groups, they have been intertwined for 225 or more million years, dinosaurs and mammals, and they're still intertwined today. And and, (laughs) and you see this every time we eat a chicken sandwich, you know, (laughs) it's like Mm -hmm, we're still mm -hmm. intertwined. Mm -hmm. What is back in in the, the, the Triassic period, 
there was a small group, uh, a group of small animals that had evolved from a group of what basically looked like reptiles. They weren't reptiles, but they were reptilian animals. They once had scales. They once sprawled, uh, you know, on, on their arms and legs, and they were once cold-blooded, and they were once slow-growing. Those were the ancestors. But this new type of animal emerged from these ancestors, and, and these were the first mammals, and they were different. They had a faster metabolism. They grew faster. Their body was covered with hair to help keep them warm. They could feed their babies milk. They had big brains. They had keen senses, especially really, really good senses of smell and hearing. Hmm. And they had a whole new suite of teeth. You, yeah. you look in the mouth of a T-Rex, all those teeth are basically the same. They all look like, you know, bananas or daggers or whatever. You look in our mouth, no way. You look in the mouth of a dog, no way. We have canines and incisors mm -hmm. towards the front of our mouths. We have premolars and molars towards the back. The incisors at the front are mostly for gripping, the canines for slicing, the premolars and molars, they grind and crush. You have all these different types of teeth that fulfill all these different roles. It's like a Swiss army knife mm -hmm. in your jaws. That was a mammal trademark. And to have those kind of teeth, that necessitated a whole new type of jaw where really we only have one bone holding those teeth. Reptiles and dinosaurs and stuff have tons of bones in their lower jaws. Mm. Mammals have one single solid bone to hold these new teeth. And because these teeth of mammals became so specialized and they had to fit together so perfectly in the upper and lower jaw in order to slice and crush food, you could only really have one set of these teeth. Dinosaurs replaced teeth throughout their lives. Mammals, mm -hmm. no, they get a little set of baby teeth that you have mm -hmm. when you're very young. Those teeth are imperfect. Sometimes they're kind of weird shape. You lose them pretty quickly. Then you have a set of adult teeth. That's it. Those teeth are so specialized that you only really get that one permanent set. And those are the things that make mammals mammals. And those things were evolving in the shadows as these tiny little animals were trying to make it in a world that was recovering from that horrible extinction where 95% of all species died, and in a world where the new dinosaurs and crocodiles and amphibians and so on were getting bigger and bigger. Mm. So, yeah. mm -hmm. different fates. Dinosaurs and mammals, different fates. Dinosaurs were destined for grandeur. Mammals stayed in the shadows for a long time, but... Mammals did diversify in the shadows. Mm. They were very successful at doing what they were doing at small size. No mammal ever got bigger than a badger during the time of dinosaurs. But did you ever see a T. rex or a triceratops the size of a mouse? No, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the mammals kept the dinosaurs from doing that. Mm. Yeah, uh, when I come, I come to that, because that was a really interesting point you made in, in the book. But it, it seems you, you talk a lot about the... You talk a lot about teeth, <laughs> talk about teeth and the jaw. And so it's this jaw closing joint and then the lower jaw as you were explaining um, and how that then fits with how the skull is shaped and all that stuff. Like this is a key feature that was not there with the precursor animals, right? So this is what starts as, it, as there's a, a new environment, as they're expanding and diversifying. This is what sets apart mammals from other animals right is some way in which the the jawbone is is uh is constructed how that's connected to the skull and then also um the idea as you said you know being warm-blooded as opposed to cold-blooded and then to have uh to have milk which is again we can look all throughout the uh animal kingdom and we see well we know that's a mammal because and i think even with the name right it's a mammal because it does this um, although there are exceptions, which you talk about in the book, where uh, I think the platypus, the, um, there's a few animals that come from eggs, right? So they don't come from, uh, so it's a little bit different. But so these are, these are the distinctive features um, of what set mammals from other animals. Now, you do mention, so if, if, if mammals and dinosaurs are cohabitating at the same time in the same period, uh, and they both survive in some ways, um, you said that dinosaurs kept mammals from getting big and mammals kept dinosaurs from getting small. So, so what do you mean by that? It was a very curious way in which you put it. And first of all, all these features we're talking about, you know, feeding babies milk, having hair, this really mm -hmm. specialized set of teeth, you know, the Swiss army knife array of teeth that have to fit together precisely in the jaws, big brains, you know, great senses. I mean, these are all sublime things. These mm -hmm. are such advanced features. They allow mammals to do so many things. 
And these are all things we have. So this, this yeah. is the root of so much of what makes us special. And so in the beginning few chapters of the, the new book, The Rise and Reign of the Mammals, I talk about this. I talk about making a mammal, how mammals mm -hmm. came to be, how mm -hmm. they were assembled by evolution, the world that they lived in for the first few, you know, hundred million years or so. And that very much was a world that was dominated by the dinosaurs. Mm. So in the Triassic, yes, you know, the dinosaurs were still quite small, still much bigger than the mammals. The mammals were very small. Then this other extinction happens. We're in the Jurassic period. Now the dinosaurs, they balloon mm -hmm. out to enormous sizes. They become totally dominant. The mammals have to stay in the shadows, but they grasped that opportunity. And mammals were so diverse. They were small. Again, none of them got bigger than a badger. This is yeah. like 150 million years of evolution. Mm -hmm. They never got bigger mm -hmm. than a badger. Mm -hmm. But even though they were small, there were mammals that could dig. There were mammals that could run. There were mammals that could scurry. There were mammals that could climb. There were mammals that could swim. There were mammals that could glide mm -hmm. on wings of skin. Mm -hmm. All this diversification was happening in anonymity in a world where the dinosaurs were the big, brash, loud ones. Hmm. And so you never saw anything like a woolly mammoth or even a human or a horse, anything of that size of mammals living with the dinosaurs. They just didn't have the space to do it. The dinosaurs were incumbent hmm. in those large body roles. But conversely, the mammals were keeping the dinosaurs at bay. The mammals were keeping the dinosaurs big. Mammals seized those small body niches. They mm. seize those niches as successfully as the dinosaurs seize the large body niches. So it very much was a, a, a you know, bipolar world there. The dinosaurs were mm. great in those larger roles. The mammals excelled in those smaller roles. Mm. And, and I, I mean, it's, you know, it's a little bit of kind of metaphor and sure, sure, yeah. English, purple prose, whatever, about, right. you know, a rat sized or a mouse sized T-Rex. <laughs> you know, but, but it's true. I mean, dinosaurs diversified to such a degree. I mean, we had dinosaurs evolve feathers and wings and start flying. We had other dinosaurs grow to the size of jet airplanes. You know, we, we had dinosaurs doing all kinds of things, but they never got tiny. Mm -hmm. They never, mm -hmm. never did it. They got to be kind of small. There were dinosaurs that were like pigeon size, house cat size, but they didn't get really tiny because that was the domain of the mammals. And it was when mammals were small, when they were playing those supporting character roles, you know, in the grand scheme of life, when they were just living there, again, kind of in anonymity. And, and it really was an anonymity in a lot of ways. A lot of these mammals only came out at night because the dinosaurs ruled the day. But mm. when mammals were living in that world, that's when they became mammals. That's when they evolved all of these things, hair and feeding their babies milk and big brains and keen senses and these very sophisticated teeth. That's when all that stuff came together. It was able to survive and to thrive in those roles underfoot of the dinosaurs. So, mm -hmm. so much of what makes us human today, this stuff evolved you know, hundreds of millions of years ago as our tiny little ancestors were trying to avoid being stepped on by a brontosaurus. Mm. It's interesting how there's there's this period for mammals of they're cohabitating with these large creatures, right? Um, and then so we have the asteroid that hits, and um, or we have the the contact, and then you know it wipes out. Uh, it's a big extinction period, and the dino they're the big the the non avian dinosaurs they're they're out of the picture, and then mammals really just just go and they diversify and, and they go they don't get as as large as dinosaurs uh necessarily um i guess in some some ex extents yes but but there's there's this element where they're diversifying so maybe it might be tough to do but how because you know people obviously just pick up the book and read it but but walk us from i guess the paleocene so right after the jurassic all the way to the Anthropocene, is that what we're calling it now, right? Or <laughs> the Holocene, whatever. <laughs> There's all these periods. Uh, the pandemic. Right? <laughs> right? So, I mean, very tough to do. But just give us a broad overview, um, especially you talk th about things such as the Paleocene, uh, Eocene thermal maximum, and that's really important for carbon methane. You talk about the rise at mammals as they as they start to go around the planet. And obviously, primates come into the picture, et cetera. So just kind of walk us through how um, the rain of mammals, right? How does that, how does that work uh, for, for mammals? Well, now things get interesting because mm -hmm. 
And they'd been interesting, but mm-hmm. these mammals were so small, even if you were around back then, you might not have noticed it. You know, we don't really notice today what mice and rats are doing until they become mm-hmm. a problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you were around during the time of dinosaurs, you might have been totally unaware of what mammals were doing in the shadows. But then, at the end of the Cretaceous period, 66 million years ago, literally there would have been T. rexes and triceratops that woke up that morning mm-hmm. on top of the food chain. And then, suddenly, this six-mile-wide asteroid falls from the sky, traveling faster than a speeding bullet. Literally, it was. Uh, It smashed into the Earth with the force of over one billion nuclear bombs put together. It it punched a hole in the crust in what is now the Yucatan Peninsula down in Mexico. It punched a hole in the crust there over 100 miles wide, and it unleashed hell. Mm. Wildfires, tsunamis, earthquakes, hurricane force winds. And that was just the stuff that happened in the immediate, mm-hmm. you know, seconds and minutes afterwards. Wildfires scarred the land. All the dust and grime went up into the atmosphere, blocked out the sun. Plants couldn't photosynthesize, forests collapsed. Plant eaters didn't have food to eat, meat eaters didn't have food to eat. Ecosystems fell like houses of cards. Then there was global warming because this asteroid smashed into a bunch of carbonate rock, so it liberated a mm-hmm. bunch of carbon dioxide. All this stuff happened. This was a serial killer with numerous weapons at his disposal. Dinosaurs, except for birds, could not cope with that, and they all died. And a lot of mammals died, too. Mm-hmm. But a handful of mammals made it through, and these happened to be mammals that were smaller mm-hmm. and mammals that could hide easier and the mammals that had more omnivorous diets that could eat a wide variety of food. Those things seem to be the tickets to success. There are even some estimates that more than nine out of every 10 mammals died Mm -hmm. when the asteroid hit. So mammals almost went the way of the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. We were almost snuffed out at that point, but we had an ancestor that made it through. (laughs) And when that ancestor and some other mammal ancestors made it through that asteroid and the wildfires were extinguished, and the atmosphere opened up again, the sun shone down to the ground again, the global warming abated. There was a new frontier, a vacuum. Mm-hmm. There was opportunity because T. rex was gone and triceratops were gone and all of those big animals that were holding back the mammals were gone. And mammals took advantage. Within a few hundred thousand years, you had mammals of the size of pigs. Remember, they never got bigger than a badger during mm-hmm. the last 150 million years. Now, within a few hundred thousand years, they're the size of pigs. Within about a million years, they're the size of cows. Mm-hmm. And then, about 10 million years later, wow, you just start getting things like elephants, giant mm-hmm. elephants, and whales. And today, the blue whale, it lives mm-hmm. with us mm-hmm. in the same world as us. It is the largest animal that's ever lived. This thing is like a submarine, absolutely mm-hmm. massive bigger than any dinosaur that ever lived. So the point is that mammals, they grasped that opportunity. They grabbed it when the dinosaurs died and they took advantage by becoming really big. They, they, they ballooned in size, just like the dinosaurs had done before. And as they got bigger, they diversified. Many new diet, diets, new ways of moving, new behaviors. Their brains eventually got bigger. Their intelligence, their senses got sharper. And that is how we got the modern mammals. Now, for the first 10 million years after the extinction, this is the Paleocene period, the mammals then were pretty weird. And these are the mammals I really like to study. So as my career has progressed, I've studied dinosaurs, and I've just naturally become interested in, okay, what happened after the dinosaurs Mm -hmm. died? And so I've really gotten uh, to be affectionate for these Paleocene mammals. And we find a lot of their best fossils in New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And, we, and, and we, at least before COVID, we used to do field work there every year. And a lot of my students uh, have gone with us. I work with a guy named Tom Williamson, who's a, uh, an eminent fossil mammal expert in that part of the world. And we've trained a lot of students together. And I have students now that, that, that are the world experts on these mammals that took over from the dinosaurs. And a lot of these mammals are strange. They, they're stocky. They're, they're kind of grotesque looking in, in, a, in a way. I mean, you look at these things, they, they look like they have, you know, these big swollen bones in their skeletons. They have big muscles on them. Really weird, you know. But it, the, from those mammals that survived and started to get bigger, that's where the root of today's mammal diversity came from. And the vast majority of mammals today, whales, bats, elephants, dogs, cats, horses, cows, Mm -hmm. humans, whatever. We are placental mammals. So we give live birth 
to well-developed young. We don't lay eggs. We don't have tiny little babies like marsupials, like koalas and kangaroos, that then those babies are born so premature they have to continue to develop in a pouch. Those are the other type of mammals that live on. There's not too many species of those mammals. In some ways, they are remnants mm. of the, the, the lost world of mammal prehistory. Mm. Today, really, except for certain places like Australia, where there's lots of marsupials, the vast majority of the world today is the domain of placental mammals. And it's being able to give live birth to bigger young. That young can develop longer in the womb. It can get bigger in utero. And then it can be fed with milk when it comes out of the womb. That whole sequence has allowed these mammals to not only get bigger, but to diversify and to be able to expand into so many ecosystems. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 so spectacular. The I mean, again, one of the things that one of the standout features of of your your new book is how you're we're we're reading our history, right? We're we're looking, you know. 150 200 million years ago and it's like wow these these when, you're, when i was reading all those parts about the jaw and everything it's like wow this is really us like this or when i look at a dog like it's is really us and and see where it's at uh, uh to current uh well i, I want to be respectful of your time and of course i could talk to you for hours about all this stuff I, it's I so fascinating it's so <laughs> i'm really sorry i, I know you no 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 it's, it's been, been great time, but it's been great i want to ask just one thing i got or i've Two final questions. The first question is just about us as humans. Um, you know, where, you know, how do we fit into this story? Uh, I kind of alluded to the Anthropocene and, and what can we make about a potential sixth extinction? You know, where, where are we at just now on, on, on the, the time scale and, and what, what is it looking like in terms of, um, you know, our history with, with others in the animal kingdom? Humans uh, are the product of hundreds of millions of years of evolution. That's something I hope to convey you know, in, in the book. I hope people reading the book come out with this feeling that humans, we are spectacular in so many ways. I mean, no species has ever been able to understand its world like us, to influence its world like us. But at the same time, we are one of many thousands of species of mammals that are also special in their own ways. And we're all the product of all these millions and millions of years of, of, of evolution. We, right now, there's Homo sapiens, us, a single species of humans. That's actually a weird thing. That's only been true for the last, at most, 40,000 years. Mm -hmm. Before then, there were Neanderthals and other types of humans. And then a bit before then, there were many species of humans living together. Mm -hmm. There are dozens of species of extinct human beings in the fossil record. Species mm -hmm. that are different than us. Mm -hmm. The same way that a dog is different than a cat. Mm -hmm. Their own human species. And we can see that line of evolution leading towards today. Now, our species is only a few hundred thousand years old. And I mean, the time scales we've been talking about here today, we've been talking about things Millions. that happened 66 million years ago, Millions. things that happened 225 million years ago. I mean, a few hundred thousand years is nothing in mm -hmm. the grand scheme of Earth history. We've been here such a short time, but we have affected the planet tremendously during that time. And we've mm -hmm. also lived during an interesting time. We are living in an ice age. Mm -hmm. We have lived alongside woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers and these giant ground sloths and armadillos and these other spectacular uh, megafauna animals. So we've lived in an interesting time. We've affected the world greatly during this time. More mammals are dying now than it seems like they had in the past before humans. Now, I put some stats at the end of my book. I'm not gonna read them all out. The <laughs> stats are boring. The point is, we're probably in the most precarious time for mammals right now since at least the asteroid hit. Remember, when the asteroid hit, maybe nine out of every 10 mammals died. Mm -hmm. We're at the most precarious point since that time. Things are changing very fast. Uh, and it's largely due to climate change, but it's not only due to climate change. It's due to the fact that there's like seven or eight billion humans on the earth now. We mm -hmm. need space. We need places to build our cities. We need places to plant our crops, to feed ourselves. Mm -hmm. This has all put tremendous pressure on mammal ecosystems and population. Mm -hmm. Now, what we see so far is we do see an elevated level of extinction. That is true. At the same time, we don't need to be alarmist. The idea of a sixth extinction. Yeah, we could be starting one. And the, the reason it's the sixth extinction, by the way, is because there's been five mass extinctions in Earth history that we see in the fossil record, five times of really elevated, catastrophic death. And maybe what's happening now is a sixth extinction. However, we're not there yet. It's not inevitable. 
the numbers so far of the, the species that have gone extinct, the rates are far below mm -hmm. what's gone extinct in the past during mass extinctions. Mm -hmm. It's not inevitable mm -hmm. that what's happening now becomes a geologically epic mm -hmm. extinction event, the kind of thing that would register in the fossil record for hundreds of millions of years in the future for some paleontologists to see. It's not inevitable. If we do just small things to better conserve our world, we'll have a much better chance of preventing that. At the same time, though, temperatures are rising very fast. There have been many other heat spikes in the past. We've talked about other instances mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. global warming. There's nothing unusual about global warming. Except right now, it's happening really fast, much mm -hmm. faster than any recorded time in the geological record, and it's happening because of us. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. And so that is having an effect on the extinctions, of course, is also going to have a big effect on us. Yeah. And that's the other thing. You know, we have grown up as a species in a certain world. You know, we have our origin story. We have our place of origin. That's planet Earth during the Ice Age. And human beings have expanded during pretty gentle climates, really, during mm -hmm. the interglacial time of the Ice Age. Many of our cities are built along the coasts. Mm -hmm. you know? Many of our crops can only grow in a very you know, narrow temperature range. These are the things we need to be concerned about because we are changing the world very quickly. We are going to have to adapt to how the world will change. Mm -hmm. And I think we can, and I'm confident mammals can. Because mammals have been through so much. If mammals could survive 150 some million years living underfoot of the dinosaurs, they can survive this. And mammals have survived many other instances of global warming and climate mm -hmm. change and so on. Yeah. So I'm, I'm confident about the future. We just need to make sure that we respect and conserve not just the mammals, but the ecosystems that are around today. A sixth extinction is not inevitable. And even the smallest things that we can each individually do mm. to slow down global warming, to prevent, you know, big environmental degradation, whatever it is, even the smallest things are important. Mm. We don't all have to save the entire world with each action. Yeah. You can all, as an individuals, seven or eight billion individuals of this one sublime species, Homo sapiens, we all have an impact when we work together. No, I, I firmly agree. Uh, I just want to leave one final fun question. You told me your favorite dinosaur was the T-Rex. Um, if you could do the Jurassic Park thing and we get the from the mosquito and we could do it all, we could recreate a dinosaur, would you, would you do it or would you, would you opt out of it? Would you be Ian e. Malcolm? What, where, where do you fall on this? I'm a big Jeff Goldblum fan, so I think, uh, <laughs> no, I, think I, 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 would, I would. I would agree with that. It's not going to happen. Well, I, you never want to say never as a scientist. That's the most dangerous thing you can do is say something's impossible. Mm -hmm. But look, nobody's ever found any fossil dinosaur DNA. And believe me, every paleontologist in the world knows that they will become famous <laughs> to an absurd degree if they find it. First. It's just DNA breaks down really quickly. So it's, yeah. to preserve that for tens or hundreds of millions of years is really tough. However, with things like woolly mammoths that went extinct so recently, we still find frozen carcasses of mammoths in Alaska and Siberia. Yeah. We have a complete genome for the mammoth. We know every wow. bit of their DNA. Maybe that's possible to clone. Mm. That's a different thing mm. altogether. But when it comes to dinosaurs, it's not going to happen. But if it could happen, I would be of the mindset that we shouldn't do it. Mm. And that pains me to say, because I've studied all these skeletons, mm -hmm. all these bones. I've studied T-Rex for decades. I've, I've poured over the nuances mm -hmm. of every little muscle attachment on his bone. My goodness, I'd love to see one alive in the flesh. You know, mm -hmm. How did it really move? How did it really raise its babies? But if we brought back a T-Rex, or a brontosaurus or a stegosaurus or whatever. I mean, we would that would be cruel. You know, the mm. world today is so different than the world they yeah. lived in. Yeah. You know, a stegosaurus or a brontosaurus never would have ever even seen a flower or a fruit. Those kind of plants hadn't even evolved yet. Mm. The climate was different. The temperatures were much higher. There was no ice caps. The continents were in different positions. Mm -hmm. It would be like an alien coming yeah. down. Yeah. our world. So I think it would be cruel to do that. Now, cloning a woolly mammoth, I do talk about this at the end of the, the new book, The Rise and Reign of the Mammals. I just give it a little bit, of, talk about it a little bit. Uh, and that is an ethically different <laughs> question yeah. for two reasons. Number one, because it could be possible. It's within the realm of possibilities. It's not a pipe dream like dinosaurs. It's not mm -hmm. something for fantasy novels and sci-fi movies. It could happen. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we probably killed the mammoth. 
you know, mm. the megafauna probably mostly died because of human actions. Mm. So should we bring back to life something mm. that we may have killed? Could we make amends for that? Now, I don't know. I actually oscillate. That's, an inter- yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting about the ethics of it. Um, and the wonders of science can, you know, the fact that that's a, even a possibility is, is, you know, spectacular. So, yeah, that's really, it's really, really fascinating. Well, look, uh, the, the, the new book is called The Rise and Reign of the Mammals. Uh, where, where can people find it? And uh, where can people find you and, uh, and your other book, The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs? Where, where are all the relevant places? People can find me most easiest on Twitter. I'm pretty easy to find. My handle is just my name at Steve Rusati. Uh, and, you know, I'm pretty easy to find online anyway. And, look, I, I love chatting with people about dinosaurs, mammals, fossils online. So please do, you know, hit me up on Twitter. As far as the books go, you can buy them from Amazon very easily, as always. But <laughs> what I, of course, prefer, if possible, is support your your local bookshops. You know, when I, when I uh, was was younger, I mean, I loved going to the bookstores. I, I learned mm-hmm. so much just by reading books that we bought as a family in the bookstores. And, you know, it's sad to see a lot of the small town bookstores close. Our, our bookshop uh, in, in Ottawa, Illinois, my hometown, is still <laughs> hanging on and doing really well. And I always love going back there when I go home. So if mm-hmm. through buying your books, you can support shops like that. Please, please do. Yeah, yeah, that's no, great. Well, well, well. Look, Steve. I mean, this was uh, such an honor and a privilege. I mean, I, I had such a blast talking about uh, history of uh, mammals and dinosaurs, and you're doing such wonderful things. And uh, I think really, really important work in in communicating um, really good, accurate science to the general public. So keep doing what you're doing. We need that. So appreciate it. Well, thanks a lot, Javier. I appreciate it. Thanks for all the great questions. The really fun chat. And um, of course. I did- appreciate the invitation and finally being able to sync up with you. (laughs) Of course. All right. Thank you.